so thank you i'm happy to to join this meeting and, and thanks for the invitation being a keynote speaker <clears throat> and i'm going to talk about the caldonides that's where i am and that's where i come from sort of and it's it's actually amazing how uh, our understanding of this origin has uh, has developed and changed since i was a student and i've tried to talk about some things that i find interesting continental subduction is in the title uh, profound origin stretching let's see so this is a this is an origin that has been uh, some focus on for a long time wilson for example i mean the caledonian appalachian um, origin as a whole has been a very important one since the uh, development of the concept of thrusting and and the wilson cycle is one thing that developed sort of out of out of this uh, this region this collision the fact that you can go from through a whole cycle from ocean to ocean and most origins collisional origins at least they start out with a pre-collisional history so we have the two continents here in this case we have Baltica here on the, the left and we have um, put this pointer here and we have Laurentia or the Balkan on the right and Laurentia on the, the left so Baltica is basically Scandinavia northern Europe Russia and, and, and then Laurentia is North America with Greenland in particular in, in, in this case, in this talk. So in between there was an ocean with island arcs, maybe microcontinents and, and various stuff that collided and did different things until the two continents collided, the two margins uh, got in contact, the ocean was subducted and that's when the collision starts. That's the point of continent-continent collision. In the Caledonian case, that was about 430 million years ago, or 25, or 30. And then starts the subduction of the continent, one continental margin under the other, and the formation of the real origin with the high mountains and, and all that exciting stuff. And then we get into extension, post-collisional extension and exhumation. And if we want, we can go on in time until we form the new ocean, which is the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a whole cycle, very pretty well defined. And what we are going to look at is this central part here, the time from the collision until you get, so not quite back to normal crustal thickness, but sort of almost at least and i there's this animation that i made at some point we have the two continents right baltica laurentia they collide thrust maps develop and then the whole thing normalizes in terms of crustal and lithospheric thickness so this iapetus ocean that was there uh, it's going to close, the two continents collide, and one margin goes down, deep down, under the other, and that's a Baltican margin that goes down. And then it comes back up again, because today we can see these high-pressure rocks at the surface. So there are these two things that I want to focus on. One is the collision, and the other one is the following extensional deformation and exhumation, which is very profound in the Caledonian origin, especially where we're going to focus, which is kind of this, this area here. So this is sort of the map view setting. We have Laurentia on the left again with Greenland um, in particular and Baltica here with Western Scandinavia, Norway. Here, these are this is the part of the system that we're going to focus on. So in Ron Blakey's uh, world, it looked like something like this: Laurentia was the bigger continent, and then Baltica is over here, and in between was this ocean, Iapetus. So this is back in the Ordovician, 485 million years early Ordovician, I guess, and then this ocean closes for 50 million years. 
and various interesting things happen, but we're not going to focus on that. And then just to show the origin, continent-continent collision just a little bit before 420, and you form this origin, which then collapses. And at that time, so this is a Caledonian origin. At that time, the Appalachian origin is, is going here, and you didn't actually reach a continent-continent collision in the Appalachian at this stage. Okay, so it was a big origin, very high mountains and deep woods. And just since this is sort of a student um, setting, just to look at origins in, in general and look at this very generalized uh, sketch. So we have the two continents, one on each side. And the two main com components of an origin is, you could say, foreland. Um, with, there are two forelands, of course, one on each side. And then there's the hinterland in the middle. There's only one of, of that. And the foreland, you know, is low temperature, low metamorphic, uh, even non-metamorphic duplexes uh, and related thrust structures, thin skin tectonics, basement not involved, at least not, not much, which is very different from what you see when you get into the hinterland where there's much more. There's high temperature, local high pressures, more ductile deformation, intricate deformation, uh, and, and more interesting deformation, or more interesting, more complicated deformation history, at least. So um, that's the case in the Caledonites too. We, we see these, uh, the foreland and the hinterland, very well exposed. The, the Caledonites is, of course, an eroded origin. So you, you, you see uh, various parts of what's buried in depth in this principal sketch. So this would be sort of um, reconstructed, very sort of reconstructed uh, section, I guess from Laurentia on the left and to Baltica on the right. And as we see, Baltica is going down here. In the right, which is the eastern part, we have these nice foreland structures, imbrications and thrusts, structures, low, te low temperature, uh, all the way to, to Oslo. Um, and this would be the hinterland in the middle, right? So that those, these are two sections, one, one from each side, actually, from Greenland and southern Norway, <clears throat> like this. And so this, this section that is shown now is B, B dash here in, in, in this Norwegian transect. And the yellow arrows here are sort of kinematic um, movement indicators or indicating the movement pattern during that collision based on, on fieldwork. A little bit more, we see detail. We see these. This is then southern Norway, and Sweden is just to the right here. Um, so one of the things I want to show now is how pressure changes in this um, section. We're focusing then on the on the eastern part, the Baltic part. So Oslo is down here, and that's sort of the the frontal, the thrust front. Uh, that we are indicated here, some of it, this is eroded away. And uh, well, there is one, for one thing, there is a little bit of a change in the thrusting direction that's interesting. But well, the, what I want to focus on is the change in pressure. So we have, of course, low pressure close to the thrust front. We don't have very good um, numbers here, but as we get closer to the hinterland, which would be here, the pressure increases. This line would be about one gigapascal pressure, which is already pretty decent. And then you get up to two and three, um, even more than three gigapascals here along the coast. So that's a very nice gradient in pressure. And these are maximum pressures recorded in the rocks. Um, so it will be sort of the time of the deepest uh, subduction, the, the climax, if you like, of the collision. And you can reconstruct just based on these pressure data, right? You can reconstruct what happened to the, <clears throat> the Baltic crust, the margin, because these numbers are from, not from the thrust maps, but they are from the continental 
margin in the continent that was there that was subducted during the collision or from the sediments that was sitting right on top of the, the continent. Okay. And the same thing, we can do the same thing for temperatures. So as we go from move from Oslo from the east to the west, northwest, the temperatures increase gradually. So we can sort of reconstruct this sort of geometry again. Now I should say that pressures and temperatures here are not necessarily completely coeval. In fact, the temperatures are probably a little bit younger than the maximum pressures. We get back to that, but but you get the point. We are looking at a collision zone where this part of that collision zone was um, continental subduction zone, basically. At least it started to subduct. Of course, you can't subduct a continental margin uh, very deep. We can subduct it fairly deep, as we will, we will see from as we see from these numbers. So out here, we're talking about more than 100 kilometers of subduction depth of the continental margin. Here is just another sort of reconstruction is from especially from a, uh, from a couple of different places, how you can sort of reconstruct the basement at the time of collision, time when it was recording these high pressures with crosite, micro diamonds, and some really nice high pressure rocks uh, out west here. It's a nice actual guide from, from about this locality here. And this, so it's important to stress that these um, pressures and temperatures are from the basement. Um, micro diamonds we find here. It's, you know, aquifers oftentimes are associated with subduction zones or with, it, with oceanic subduction, right? And, and you get um, high pressure conditions down the subduction channel and you get the sort of return flow up and aquifers coming back up closer to the surface. This is, that's something, something different. This is, this is the basement itself during continent continent collision that is brought deep down and then it comes back up again. Well, we haven't reached that yet. So we are in Norway and here we, we like to think about trolls, uh, at least we did in the old days when we were trying to explain things in nature, it wasn't so easy to explain. So one put some trolls in here and uh, this troll here is doing the thrusting work, right? This is what happened when the collision was going on. The pieces, fragments of, of the crust and whatever was in between these two continents, these pieces were, were thrust uh, east, so these words on top of the dome going continental margin of Baltica. So that's nice. And when I was a student, this was all, all the structures that you could see in, in the field were attributed to to, to thrusting and thrust movements. Then came the kinematic indicators. And this was in the 19, about 1980. We started to understand kinematic indicators much better, right? Shear bands, asymmetric broodings, um, all kinds of asymmetric structures. And that was a major breakthrough and it changed our understanding of shear zones and thrusts and high strain zones in many parts of the world, including the Cadmonites. And uh, in the Cadmonites, it turns out that most of the structures and all of the, the, the obvious structures that you first would encounter if you go in the field and look at the rocks, would indicate the wrong sense of shear. It would indicate a transport not from the hinterland to the foreland, but from the foreland to the hinterland. Just a field example to show at least one of a couple of field photos. This is typical SC structure, and you can also see asymmetric folds forming fold trains here, and it's all verging to the northwest toward, toward the hinterland. So that uh, changed things, uh, changed the way we understood these things. So this trawl would then have to done more than just push these rocks to the east. It also caused some, some extensional collapse, extensional structures. 
and backwards motion of this this thrust sheet or pile of thrust sheets here to the northwest, which would be to the to the left. So let's see here. I showed this sort of reconstruction. If we look at the section today, it looks like this. So the difference is, of course, all these red lines and also deformation along this black zone here with these asymmetric folds. And this was sort of the figure, field photo I showed from, from, from this part here. So a lot of extension or reworking. You go there and look at the an origin and what you, if you understand kinematic indicators and things that most people do these days, then what you what strikes you is extensional deformation. It's the wrong sense of shear relative to the collision. So then let's go back to this map. So this was the map showing the thrusting direction, right? The, the transport direction of thrust maps uh, opposite on each side of this sort of suture, which we cannot really see very well today, but it's somewhere in this region. And then we can put on the extensional structures. So again, this is to give you an uh, impression of the very profound extensional reworking of that orogenic structure that formed during the collision. Very, very profound. And I have not seen really anything um, exactly like this. And, and there, are, there are similar things, but this is very, very profound, very strong in this origin right here. And especially in this region that we are focusing on here. So here, here is that section again. That will be the same section now from B here to B prime. So that will be this one here. This red line here would be that one. And then there's another one, Northfield MSDZ, Northfield Song Detachment Zone here. Very, this, these are tens, maybe 100 kilometer uh, displacement shear zones, the biggest ones. So we'll go back to this um, animation now. We pay a little bit more attention to not only the collision, to the thrust maps, but this whole history, which brings that route back up close to the surface uh, by extensional deformation and exhumation. So one more time, ocean closing, the two continents colliding and Baltica going down, high pressures, and then it comes back up, it heats up too. And we get this extensional framework that is very profound. So, so the Baltic margin, the continent, margin of this continent went deep down. It must have been relatively cold, relatively strong. And it also was fairly quick in the sense it didn't last that long. So it came down here as a relatively cold unit. It must have because otherwise it wouldn't have been able to reach these depths. And then it started to heat up. When it got down in the warm, deep mantle, it started heating up. And that was actually, actually most profound during the extensional and exhumational history. So this uh, is a figure from Lavos showing that we get some, some melting and things going on at depth. But the large, you know, enlarged this, this, uh, this margin was going down in one piece, we believe. And here is some example of melt forming in the toe, so the frontal part, the deepest part of the Baltic margin. So there is definitely excess melt there too. Even though this uh, this is an interesting place, is just in this area here. It, it was closed for a long time because conditions were pretty cold before it opened during the exhumation, and we got some melting. So that's a place called Hell in that region, but just by chance. <clears throat> so I want to show this <clears throat> sort of simplified but useful uh, sort of pattern that um, people, many people think of when in terms of orogenic evolution from small 
uh, early origin to a large sort of Himalaya Tibetan type origin. So the general way of thinking of origins is that you form a small origin and it's cold because it's not very old basically. And then you form the Pyrenees would be an example of that. We'll hear more about the Pyrenees tomorrow. Uh, the Alps would be a little bit more intermediate. And then you end up in this simple scheme. You end up with sort of Himalayan, Tib Tibet, um, plateau-like origin where the middle crust is now starting to melt and you have a very weak middle to lower crust with things like channel flow occurring and plateau formation at the top, the Tibetan plateau. Uh, the point here is that the Keldonites never reached this stage. It reached the same size in terms of uh, displacements and width uh, to a large extent of the origin, but it didn't, as the way I, I see it, reach that plateau stage, really. Why is that? Well, this is this is basically what happened is you put this cold slab down the continental margin, the Baltic margin down, and then it doesn't stay there long enough before the extension kicks in, and then it moves up, and then it starts melting. And then it's too late to form a, a sort of Himalayan type orogenic um, origin. Um, <clears throat> it's actually been modeled by Butler and others uh, 2015, this, this model of, of mine here. So what they did was they, they put this into a numerical model. They put the, the continental margin down. And uh, to do that, they also concluded from their modeling that it has to be rigid, it has to be cold, relatively cold, and goes down. And then, so these arrows indicate things are going down, right? Then things change, the kinematics change, and you can see this arrow here is opposite. It's the back uh, sliding of the orogenic edifice, the, the orogenic wedge on top of the, the basement here. The basement is basically pulled back, and that's called eduction, the opposite of subduction. So it's first subducted, then educted, and that's what this arrow also indicates. This thing is pulled back, basically, and you reverse the kinematics at the top of this, this uh, continental uh, margin, and you get extensional deformation right on top of that. And then you, at the same time, you move, uh, you assume the subducted margin. And this is um, interesting. You see the arrows uh, pointing up now, and, and you get things very close to the surface over a relatively short period of time. It's, uh, it's 20 million years between the top and the bottom here, this model. And you can, in the model, you can put in these. Um, um, temperature, pressure, sort of model paths, which show a very characteristic and you know, it's a clockwise, right, um, pattern. And that's what we see in the real data too, in the field data that's where we estimate pressures and temperatures is taken from many different sources, that you have this clockwise pattern. So this first path here, reaching the maximum pressure would be the maximum depth of, of uh, subduction rate. And that's up here actually to be accurate. And then um, pressure goes down, but temperature still increases to the right here until about 2.2, which would be more or less here. So you get more heating and also you get the decompression. The pressure is now and lowered from 0.1 to 0.2 quite significantly, which means that you more easily start to melt the rocks. And now you're starting to melt, and now you're starting to soften the whole system. But it's too late to prevent this slab to go, go down deep. And then three, of course, in the end, we get down here. So it's interesting, the melting in this origin happens on the way back to the surface during extensional deformation, not during collisional kinematics or convergence. 
And what happens then during extension is a little bit different. It's, it starts to, the, the lower and the middle crust starts to, uh, to become soft and flexible. And we get these uh, uh, sort of domes and big folds that develop into core complexes with major shear zones on top of these core complexes and basins. This would be in the Devonian. So we get Devonian basins here. Well, this is um, some nice work by a uh, recent student at uh, the University of Bergen, Johannes Wiest, and the next figure two, who illustrated this. So this would be the coastal area of, of uh, South Norway. So it would be this area right here, with these um, things swinging in and out like that, with basins on the top, and this hot crust sort of now moving up into these uh, four complexes that are bound by, in blue here, extensional shear zones, some of very large displacements. So this melting, this is concluded from, from dating the melts, of course, in these different places. And the dates are from most of them 410 to 390, 375. So just at the end or after the convergence ceases and uh, divergence starts. So um, I think a very important thing that helps explain the Chalidonites in, in this part of the origin at least is that the whole orogenic process was tectonically aborted. It was cut off at 405 million years from what we have uh, dated. That's when the whole thing was cut off and we started to have adduction divergence and we never reached the hot orogenic, hot contractional stage, but we've got no melting occurring during extension in the post orogenic stage. So not much melting here a little bit, but then most of it during the exhumation. That's how do we explain that? Well, there's one explanation that was put forward by Patrice uh, Ray back in 1997, that is still quite interesting. And that's, you know, the push from the south. There was Avalonia here in the Devonian that seems to have been pushing northwards. And with this shake here, it could have started some divergent movement between um, Scandinavia, Baltica, and Laurentia. So something like this, right? So that would be a good explanation, I think, for this divergence, why you got this sudden change from collision to um, divergence and extension. So just to conclude with some points, I think in the Keldenite case, in, in where we, and especially in southern Scandinavia, we had a very strong continental crust, relatively cool, maybe there was mineralogical reasons for that too, that allowed for deep subduction. <clears throat> and then we had a very short-lived collision. It was aborted after 20, 25 million years before you got the really hot orogenic stage. But then still you got melting instead on the way up during exhumation and thinning um, <clears throat> and divergence <clears throat> and softening of this deep crust during exhumation created very nice core complexes in the hinterland. And, and major shear zones. So different from the Himalayan origin for sure, and sort of a cool and short-lived origin, but still very big and wide, which is fairly unusual. So that's what I wanted to present. So thanks for listening to that.